Hey kid, over here. Wanna buy a watch? Um, no, but I have questions for gear tasting. Okay, I'll take those. Hey guys, welcome to Gear Tasting, where we show you what we're up to and currently evaluating at ITS headquarters. So today I've got a couple of things that came in. Um, the first I'll talk about is the Gen 2 Naga hoodie from Arterix. Um, this is in wolf gray color. I've really liked this so far. It's still a little warm in Texas to, to wear a hoodie, um, especially one that's kind of fleece lined like this. I'll try not to make too much noise with the mic. But uh, so, this is a medium. I typically wear a medium in Arcteric stuff, just in case you're wondering. Um, but my t-shirt size is large, so I'm not quite sure where that leaves me. But So at any rate, um, I haven't quite looked at what the Gen 1 to Gen 2 upgrades are on the Naga hoodie yet. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's kind of in the general release yet stage of the, uh, of the Naga hoodie, the Gen 2. It might be. I have to kind of research that. I j literally just got it in, so I haven't had much time to take a look at it. Um, one thing I do like that I've just been kind of noticing on this, I like that there's elastic around the wrists. I think that's a very important feature, as well as I like these thumb holes. Um, I think that's kind of a, a nifty feature for kind of cold weather. Um, and then, like I said, the, it's fleece lined and it's a super soft fleece. Um, I'm really impressed with how, how soft that is too. It's got a little side access pocket here and a little zipper. Um, and I like the fact that the, the neck so far, you've still got a collar. So the hood itself lays very flat back here. So it's kind of a flat collar, or I'm sorry, flat hood. And then you still got a collar. So um, definitely, uh, definitely digging it. Okay, so another thing we just got in is the roll pin tool from my good friend Nick at Oni Gear Industries. So he has developed a roll pin tool for putting in the roll pin on a bolt catch for the AR-15. So while I'll demonstrate that, um, I wanted to just quickly mention I'll be pulling from our abnormally large spare parts kit for the obsessive compulsive that I put together. Um, I did do an article on this on ITS, so um, if you haven't seen this kit yet, um, definitely check out the article for kind of an in-depth look at what's in here and kind of the method behind my madness. Um, so with the bolt catch, when you install it on an AR-15, there's kind of two schools of thought, and the two schools involve the direction on which you put the roll pin into the, the, the lower receiver. So in our original AR-15 series videos that we did a long time ago, drop my tools, um, we recommend going from left to right. So basically when you insert the pin, you're going from... Yeah, so if I'm facing you, that would be your left on camera. So left to right. So Brownells developed a unique roll pin punch tool um, to actually, it's got a flat surface on it as well as a rounded side for hitting with a hammer. So it actually rides on the, the flat part of this as you're driving it in again from left to right. So you still have to um, start with a roll pin holder. So that's kind of the... Uh, I guess the methodology behind what Nick has created over at Oni too is that you've got a roll pin holder. So let me get the parts out first. So to install the bolt catch, just real quick, you'll need a plunger, a bolt catch spring, bolt catch roll pin, as well as the bolt catch itself. So a lot of little parts here. So first you would put in the spring and the plunger into this little area here. So once your plunger is in, then you press in the bolt catch and you have to hold tension there and then drive through the pin. So to drive through the pin, again, you would have to have some type of roll pin holder. Um, don't be a knucklehead like a bunch of guys out there and just use vice grips to just press it in. I guess you could use that, but again, I'm an advocate of having the proper tools for the job. So. Um, a roll pin holder, like this one from Brownells, this is a number three roll pin holder. Um, you know, it's designed, again, um, to start the roll pin. I'll 
I'll show you real quick. So this is just an example of the tools that I have. So right here, if you're starting from left to right, you're, you're kind of at a disadvantage going this way already because you can see the angle that I'm having to put on this um, if I do do the left to right drive. So, and you have to do this anyway to start the roll pin. You have to have some type of holder to start tapping it in because even on the tool that Brownells has here, um, there's, there's nothing to secure the roll pin you know, to this. It's just a kind of a nipple on the end that helps um, interact with the pin as you're driving it in. So you still need some type of holder. So you could come, you know, again from right to left with the, the Brownells tool, um, but then again, um, you're kind of at a disadvantage there too because of the knurled kind of grip that's on this tool. You're kind of scraping by your, your receiver. So, I mean, you can tape it up too so you're not scratching anything, but uh, the Oni Gear Industries tool is designed to specifically not mar the surface. So um, because of the, the shape of the tool, what you get is kind of these multiple flat sides. So if you look, it lines up very well um, with the correct orientation of the hole right there if you're driving from right to left. So another thing I like about this versus the Brownells tool, when it's and super lightweight, um, but it's also very strong, so if you put the roll pin into this number three roll pin holder from Brownells, the roll pin just falls right out. Um, I like that Nick has designed this to have some tolerance in it to, to actually hold the roll pin in there. I think that's you know an important part when you're putting together ARs is you don't want to have to worry about the roll pin holder you know losing your roll pin as you're driving it in too. So anyway, that's just a, a quick look at what he's come out with here. This is the roll pin tool again from. Oni Gear Industries. Um, good packaging too, by the way, Nick. I like it. All right, so let's move on to the next item. Okay, so let's jump into some questions over coffee. This uh, questions over coffee is brought to you by Boss Coffee and Silky Black. Uh, my buddy Blake sent me a few of these. These are uh, from Japan. They're a little hard to find where I'm at, so he sends me some every once in a while, so thanks, Blake. Um, the first question is from Ru, or RU, on, from Twitter, who asks, as a climber, I usually have a Petzl harness for a bug out situation. What tactical belt can be the best as a replacement? So I assume you're asking about a replacement for a dedicated climbing harness. Well, in my opinion, there really isn't a replacement for uh, a dedicated climbing harness. There are some good alternatives um, for emergency situations. So the first that I'll talk about is one that, you know, I've actually created a video on. I've actually repelled with this belt before and this belt alone. So this is the Ultimate Riggers belt from 215 gear. And they've sewn in a waist loop into the Riggers belt, as you can see. So you just put a carabiner in there and you can use this as an emergency repelling device um, or emergency repelling belt. So it utilizes a Cobra buckle, which is, uh, is definitely rated for the kind of weight that you would be you know, encountering on emergency repel. Um, again, I have done this, although I would caution you not to unless it was an emergency situation, um, but I kind of wanted to find out for myself whether this was good to go, and it definitely is. So check out that video, we'll link to it. Um, and then the other, one of the other options is, I've recently been using the H150 riggers belt from Arteryx Leaf. So this is basically a belt that's got a, a waist loop here, so you would tie into this point right there. And then what I like is that it's, when they first came out with the H150, they didn't have the optional leg loops, which I'll show in a second. Um, they just had the riggers belt, so I was kind of excited when they came out with the, uh, the extra leg loops. Um, there's a lot that's gone into the construction for this. Um, I'm not going to really get into it, but basically they take the webbing that's right here and they actually pull out strands to actually make it flat. So this webbing actually runs all the way through the belt. You can see it pop out the other side here. Um, but they take out, and I can't remember what the so waft, but there's a thread that they pull out of the, I guess the height of the webbing, so to speak. And it actually flattens out and creates that. So it's very comfortable to wear. But again, you've got this dedicated uh, loop here for tying in at. Then, 
And I like this, uh, this bag that the leg loops come in because you can put it on the back of the belt and just have it back there in case you need to repel. So the leg loop, or I, it's loops, but it's really just one big piece here. So what that would look like is you would step into it just like this. Make sure this is all flat here. And then bring it up like this. And then it interfaces with the belt here. So you would take a carabiner, place it through here, or you would tie in and tie in through the leg loops and through the, the belt here. Let's drop the other side. So that's another option too, is the Arteryx H150 Riggers belt. Then there's a third option I kind of wanted to talk through as well. Um, this is this is a harness from Yates. So this is it's kind of a kangaroo pouch design. So this is worn. Let me fumble with it some more here. So this is worn here like this. I'll just go ahead and do this so it'll stay on real quick. So this would be worn, you know, through your pants loops. So what you've got here is a pouch that has your leg loops in it. So you can now put these on and then it all folds up in that pouch too. So you would clip in the leg loops here. These are Cobra buckles, which I like as well. So you've got Cobra buckles for the leg loop there. And then you've got your, your waist loop here to tie into or to clip into. So those are a couple options. Um, the model of this Yates harness escapes me right now and it's called the Tactical Repel Belt. So it says 304 Tactical Repel Belt. So there you go, that's from Yates. So those are a couple options. Hope that helps you out. All right, so the next question comes from Jared B on Twitter who asks, what about a look at Brian's watch collection? I'm a huge watch pound tag watch nerd and every watch he has looks cool I've even seen his pound tag G-Shock so um, I'm actually wearing G-Shock today that's by far pretty much my go-to everyday watch um, I wear it at the gym every morning when I go work out um, if I'm doing any kind of I guess strenuous outdoor activities I usually throw a G-Shock on just because I don't like the hassle of uh, worrying about glass breaking um, if I break my G-Shock it's 50 bucks, 60 bucks to go replace it versus a couple hundred box, bucks for the other watches that I wear on a regular basis too. So I've only got into other watches other than a G-Shock in the last couple of years. Um, and that all started when the guys from Muster pulled their resources together and purchased a Resco Black Frog for me. It was one of the coolest gifts I've ever been given. Total surprise and just awesome. Um, so big fan of Resco, um, even wore my shirt today for the video. Um, they're out of Coronado, California. I can't recommend what they do highly enough. Um, it's great to support a U.S. company and especially one that makes badass watches. So a little shout out to Resco there. And I actually own two of them. So since the first one that the Mustard guys got me, thank you guys again for this awesome gift. Um, I've really kind of gotten into automatic watches as well as quartz watches kind of um, has escalated from there. So now I have three of them. I also have a GPT-1. This is from Countycom or Martech, Maritech, I believe. Um, they've come out with a GPT-2, I believe, and that actually just moved. I think it changes some things around. Hopefully they corrected the problem of the bezel, which really spins pretty loosely. Um, that's one of my... One of my small gripes with it. I really love the watch though. Um, and that, again, that's an automatic too. So the Black Frog and the GPT-1 are both automatics. Then I have the Resco Manus, which is a quartz watch. Um, it's got a chronograph on it, which I like too. But I like that um, the two Rescos that I have have dates on it. And according to Rob, who's a bigger watch aficionado than I am, it's called a complication. So these both have a date complication but the GPT-1 does not, so I wish it did. I, I really like glancing down and seeing the date on a watch. So again, this is um, also my G-Shock, and I believe this is the 6900, so this is the 6900 MS. So this is the blacked out one that they came out with a couple years back. 
Um, I used to just wear the standard 6900 for a while. I've still got one of those. Uh, it's still ticking. Um, sorry, Timex, I kind of stole their line, but at any rate, um, I like the functions of this. It's got a chronograph, a stopwatch, a timer, uh, backlight, which I like too, and I like that it's kind of blacked out. What's so funny? Okay, so it's got a chronograph and stopwatch. All right, um, it's got an alarm, it's got a timer, it's got a chronograph, and that's it. Right, so it's got those things, and it tells the time, and it's military time, which I like too. So, as you can see, I also have a one of these Suunto Clipper compasses on every watch I own. I swear by these little things. It's a great backup compass. So. That is my watch collection, pound tag, watch nerd. Okay, a couple more things. I'm such a watch nerd, I need to share more. Uh, this leather strap is from One Star Leather. They're also a US company. I'd like to give a shout out to them too. Um, I purchased this probably, probably a year ago now, if, at least, maybe more. But I really love how the leather is worn in and the coloration on this. So when I move the compass, you can kind of see the original color that it was and as it's worn. And, I've used the, uh, the leather balm that they sell to to kind of condition this as well. So really like those. And one more thing, don't buy the Brookstone watch winder. Um, that's kind of a tangent. We can, I guess, talk about watch winder somewhere else. But I have a Brookstone watch winder I got for Christmas last year, and it's a piece of shit. Um, I'm just going to say it. it it's, uh, it's constantly screwing up on me. I kind of have to, like, shake the watch winder to get it to come back on and start up again. It's Anyway. Next. All right, so this next question is a twofer. We've actually been asked this by a couple of different people. So Andrew asks, what kind of knee pads do you like? I feel that knee pads are a bit overlooked. Thanks. Um, and the other one comes from YouTube. Knee pads, what works, what doesn't, what lasts, and what's crap. I'm tired of twists and falls of knee pads. <laughs> uh, <laughs> some are expensive. Are they worth the extra money? So um, I brought in my box of knee pads and elbow pads. Um, and I'll just go through a couple of different options. Um, first off are these, I believe these are uh, Altamas. I can't even tell anymore. But So I bought these a long time ago. Um, and just to tell you up front, I don't wear knee pads and elbow pads. I never really have. I've experimented with them before, hence why these aren't super banged up. Um, I wore them when I was skateboarding a lot, but since I've been doing tactical stuff like shooting and things like that, I don't really wear those. Um, I just kind of deal with it if I have to take a knee or something like that. I really, I really don't, uh, I don't use them. So um, these, like I said, I'll, I'll make sure I have the, the right nomenclature in the description for the YouTube video of what these exactly are, but I think they're Altamas, I believe. And then there's these from Cry, which fit into their field pants, which I'll show you in just a second. Um, they make two different versions. These are actually the older school version of the field pants knee pads. They actually make some that are better now that have more, um, allow for more airflow and ventilation. They've got some cuts on them and things like that. These are the, I guess the first gen when they came out with their field pants. Um, and then their combat stuff, shirts and pants, um, use something similar to this. this is, these are the elbow pads. I have a combat shirt, but I don't have combat pants from Cry. Um, so they kind of fit inside a, a cutout, so this goes in and wraps around, and then this is what's actually external. So, And then I have some from Arteryx that, uh, that interface with a pair of pants that I have here. So let's just go ahead and show how those interface. I'll start with the Cry ones first. So um, I actually like both the Cry and the Arteryx ones the best. Um, I don't really like the over-the-knee version like this, it's kind of the the old school skater pads like that. Um, these are nice because they actually go inside the pants. They're just, it can just kind of be a, a pain to get in sometimes. You kind of have to fold these up and then turn them. So it wasn't too bad. So then you put them in that cap right there. And as you can see there, the, the field pants from Cry um, have a little reinforced knee area. So this is a, a heavier duty Cordura, whereas this is like rip stop. So these are the ones from Cry. Again, they just interface to the bottom in a Velcro access point. And then on the Arteryx knee pads, I'm gonna have to turn the pants inside out. These are the Sphinx pants. So you can 
can see they've got this tweed material. It's a stretch material where the knee pad fits. So there's a Velcro channel. These caps go in. Make sure I'm putting these in the right way. So what they've got is a little pass-through as well. So once you actually get them in the channel, you've got two pass-throughs, which are where the straps come through. So if I was going to use these all the time, I would probably just leave these in the pants. Pain doing this each time. So it's kind of good to see exactly what it takes to get these in there, too. So one thing that's good about these is you actually get not only the behind the pants kind of protection with these knee pads, but you still get the added benefit of having a strap um, as well that kind of helps secure these. So these go around, just clip in like that. And the top strap is elastic and the bottom strap is nylon. So, so that's the way they look. You've got the elastic strap at the top, nylon at the bottom, and then it's fit behind the, the heavy duty nylon piece that's in, or webbing that's in the front. Um, so one thing about the Sphinx pants too is my only complaint with them, I love them, I love the tweed material, but they do get a little hot in the knees with this extra piece of webbing if you're not wearing um, knee pads. But I do like the fact that this protects you too. So like I said, if I'm not wearing knee pads and I am taking a knee, um, this is kind of acts as a protective layer, not necessarily padding, but at least protection when you're taking a knee. So those are a few options for, I guess, knee pads and elbow pads. Hope that answers your question. All right, hope you enjoyed this episode of Gear Tasting. Thanks for watching. Be sure to send in your questions through all the social media outlets with the pound tag Gear Tasting. Thanks again.